everybody. Welcome to tonight's event, Women Making History in Children's Media. I'm Karen Martin. I'm the VP of CMA. Um, before we get started, I wanted to share that this event and all our programming is created by a team of CMA volunteers who are passionate about sharing content from all of our verticals within our community. As our content continu continues to expand, our team also needs to grow, so I ask that you consider volunteering with CMA in a leadership or support role so we can continue creating and delivering this kind of programming to you. In celebration of Women's History Month, we are speaking with five phenomenal female leaders in children's media. I'm so excited to hear about their journey, their success, challenges, and advice for the next generation. I have so many questions for them, and I'm sure you do as well. So if you'd like to add any questions, um, we'll be taking them at the end. Please put them into our CMA LinkedIn page, and we'll get to that at the last 15 minutes of this event. So let's meet our panelists. Our first panelist is Ellen Darty. She is Chief Creative Officer for Fred Rogers Productions and oversees the development and production of content for all platforms. She's a three-time Emmy Award-winning producer and writer with more than 20 years experience in children's media, who began her career as an associate producer on the beloved PBS Kids series, Reading Rainbow. She serves as executive producer for the company's current series on PBS Kids, Daniel's Tiger's Neighborhood, Odd Squad, Don Quixote, Alma's Way, and the award-winning Through the Woods Nature series, which is also on PBS Kids. Ellen was spotlighted in Variety's 2022 Family Entertainment Report, and in 2018, she was nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award for Mr. Rogers' It's You I Like. Our next panelist is Lynn Keston Sessler. She is a Peabody, Webby, and Parents' Choice Award-winning producer and development executive. She is the cre Senior Creative Director at Nickelodeon, overseeing the creative development and production of Nick's audio and video podcasts, ranging from preschool ages up through YA. Lynn has created digital podcasts and TV programming for Nickelodeon, PBS, Netflix, Audible, Noggin, Sesame Workshop, Pinna, and Common Sense Media. She's honored to sit on Children's Media Association's Board of Advisors. Next is another CMA member, Sarah Wallenjack. She is the Vice President of Production and Development, as well as an executive producer at Nine Story Media Group. She is the supervising producer of Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, for which she received an Emmy in 2019. She's an executive producer of Super Y on PBS and also on Charlie's Colorform City on Netflix. Sarah also worked on Nickelodeon's Wonder Pets, Disney's Go Baby, and Johnny and the Sprites. Sarah was also a former president of the Children's Media Association. And hailing from Australia, Joey Egger is our next panelist, and she is an Emmy, Peabody, and Webby award-winning kids digital content specialist with 20 years of experience, including Sesame Workshop and ABC Kids. She is currently the managing director at Two Moo's Debt, where she and Team Moo are proud to collaborate with the world's most respected kids content creators, nonprofits, healthcare, and educational specialists to bring their visions to life. And finally, we have Jennifer Oxley, who hails from Hollywood, California. She was born there and caught the filmmaking bug early, where she made her first film at the tender age of seven. Since then, she's created loads of short films with her production company, Snowflake Films New York City, including segments for Sesame Street and an adaptation of Spike Lee's children's book, Please Baby Please. Museum, Museum of Modern Art acquired her latest film, The Music Box, for their permanent children's film collection. In the kids' TV world, Jennifer won her first of four Emmy Awards for her role as director on Little Bill. She later went on to create the look and animation style of the critically acclaimed series, The Wonder Pets. Most recently, Jennifer redeveloped Clifford and Big Red Dog for TV and co-created the hit PBS kids' animated series, Peg and Cat. She's currently the showrunner at Spin Master's new animated series, Vita the Vet. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to have you here. So I'm going to start this off. I'm going to throw this question to Ellen. What made you want to become part of children's media? What inspired you to be part of this? Uh, well, I figured it out in college, basically. And, you know, as with many things, there were a lot of different things that sort of added up together and bubbled into this idea. Um, but uh, I went into college thinking writing, advertising, journalism, something. And um, there were multiple, you know, things that happened over the course. One is that I discovered that television seemed to be able to allow me to do all the kinds of things that I wanted to do, which was make stuff and tell stories, but I didn't have to be a good drawer to do it. Like I thought I would, if I went into like advertising or something, I don't know. I really did not have a clue what advertising really entailed. But um, one of the key moments I think was uh, a summer job one year. Um, I was working at Myers, which is like a target in the Midwest. 
and I got assigned to the toy department. And uh, I was just, you know, sales associate. And this kid came in one day looking for an action figure. It might have been He Man. It was something, it was a show that I didn't know. And he came in and he asked for this action figure, a specific one. And I said, Which one is that? Meaning red shirt, black shirt, blonde <laughs> hair, brown hair, which one? And he told me the whole story, the whole mythology of this character and the world. And I was like, on the one hand, okay, you're, I still don't know which one you want. But also, wow, look at all he knows about this world. And imagine if this was something useful, because <laughs> it was really very detailed. And uh, I went home and talked to my parents that night. And I was like, wow, you know, like, imagine if it was something like history, you know, something where you have a really complex world with many layers and that was just the world of a show and you could learn something through that you know um so that was one of those moments that was just really i had like that clear idea of oh what about this and um uh so that's that's one of the things that really put me on the path and when i graduated um from college i knew that i wanted to get into kids tv and where'd you go next after college did you go right into some uh, no, I did not have a job when I graduated. And my parents, uh, I went to Boston College and wanted to stay in town after graduation. And my parents were like, uh, no, we're not paying for you to stay in Boston and hang out with your friends. So you can come home and live for free and we'll give you a car and you can try to figure out how to find a job. So I worked retail for a year um, and then went back east for a wedding um, in Massachusetts and also went to New York to look for a job um, and actually found one <laughs> to my amazement. Um, I uh, found an ad in the New York Times as you did then, the print New York Times, the big Sunday paper, you spread it out on the ground, on the floor, you know, and just go through every column inch, which seriously, like inch by column inch, like, and I found this tiny ad that was for literally like, like really tiny. Um, that said assistant to the producers for a children's television company. And I was like, oh, that's what I want to do. That's perfect. And I called and it was reading Rainbow. Oh, and wow. now the funny thing here, again, about what I did not know is that I had interned for them a year before. <laughs> and it was just three days, like a few days after I graduated from college, they were shooting in Boston for the Mummies Made in Egypt book for that episode at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I was an intern and I was there for three days. So I met people, but I didn't get to know people. And it was fascinating. And that's a whole nother story. But I got a business card from one person and she wasn't actually that friendly. So I didn't ever call and she ended up leaving the company. So I don't know if it would have helped me, but I did not think to call them when I was looking for work to say, hey, do you have any jobs? And um, I did not think when I was going to New York a year later to be like, hey, do you have any jobs? So it was really that I saw the ad in the New York Times is how I found the job with people I had met. And um, and that's why I really think I have, you know, it's really hard to figure out how to do this, how to find jobs in this industry. And um, it's really important to hold a hand out to people when they're trying to figure out how to find a job because it's not obvious. Um, and uh, and I got, you know, I got that job and moved to New York two and a half weeks later. Wow, that's great. Joey, what was your experience? Uh, I uh, I guess my first experience into tech uh, itself was um, playing Zork as a kid, which was one of the first text-based games on a Commodore 64. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and then um, after university, I did a Bachelor of Arts because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I all I knew is I wanted to go to Japan, so I started... I got a job um, teaching English at a private school in Japan. Um, didn't have the qualifications um, and really loved working with kids. And I've got teaching in my background, like on all sides of the family. But there was this one kid um, called Satoshi who wanted to learn English through, um, he wanted to learn how to code, actually. He wanted to learn HTML. And we had a computer at the time and I didn't know anything about HTML. And um, uh, he wanted to learn HTML but knew that it was all in English, so he had to learn English to do it. So we figured out and came up with some um, lessons that taught both of us how to code and taught him English at the same time. Um, 
And uh, I like to think I helped him on some marvelous career, but it actually helped me on a marvelous career where I eventually found myself at ABC Kids um, in Australia, um, working first as a production assistant, but because I was really curious and because websites were just coming in then, um, nobody wanted to be responsible for websites, so they just got the production assistants to do it, which were actually all women. So all the different TV shows, it was all like women doing that. So to this day at ABC in Australia, a lot of the executives in the digital section are still women because we all kind of grew up through that. Um, and then, yeah, just through that, I got into ABC Kids um, Digital doing uh, website stuff. And through that, um, I was working on a show called Five Minutes More, which was a Henson production. And then someone there saw there was a job at Sesame Street and we had a laugh because it was the same job position that I had at ABC. And so I applied for it for a laugh and I got the job and I had to move overseas in six weeks. Um, and I had an amazing journey at Sesame Street for seven years with some wonderful people. And, um, and as part of that, I um, uh, was uh, hiring this little tiny company called Tubals, um, who did some really interesting stuff with um, innovation technology, such as um, augmented reality. And uh, I really liked them. And I eventually moved to them to start the Tumus division. And um, yeah, we've just grown since then. And then in September, we got acquired by a company called an agency called Dept. So uh, everything's kind of crazy right now but yeah we're we're really enjoying all the work that we're doing with um kids media and nonprofits. um and um hopefully uh can tell you a bit about some of the um uh new tech stuff we're doing as well yeah that'd be great well i know you guys have all worked together in some capacity so yeah. lynn, <laughs> lynn how did you start um so funny enough so i was a i went to barnard college um columbia so I was in New York City and I got an internship at MTV my senior year and just stepped on the, the stage at the studio and fell in love with this whole TV world. Um, but when I graduated, and Karen, you were right, you remembered the story better than I did for a minute. <laughs> we were proud of um, there was no jobs at MTV. And so the person that I worked for, it was a wonderful woman named Nina Silvestri. Um, and Claire Joseph, who were awesome at MTV. And they said, you know what? We heard that there's this production assistant job at Nickelodeon. Um, it's just a two week job, but maybe you want, might want to just, you know, just go there and just see how it is. And so I interviewed with a wonderful woman named Debbie BC, okay. who um, loved the fact actually that I hadn't gotten a television degree, that I was an English major and a theater major. And she thought that's kind of cool. So she hired me for what was supposed to be a two week job in the promo department. And it ended up being a two year job. And it was during the time of Jerry Laybourne, who's one of my heroes, yeah. um, in women's TV or TV in general. Um, and it was such an incredible time at Nickelodeon. They had this producer and training program. And so they taught us how to be producers. They were, they were here, write a script. So we'd write a script and they'd be like, okay, you got it. Now you got an assignment, go write a script. Okay, now you're gonna learn how to direct. Um, here's how to do a voiceover session. Here's how to do an edit session. Here's how to do a live action um, project. And so we learned how to be producers. It was really an incredible opportunity. And after about two years, they said, well, you know what? We just don't have the head count for you to be promoted. So I did go to MTV for a year, but the last day as a PA at Nickelodeon, Jerry Laybourne came over to me and said like, I can't believe you're leaving. Why are you leaving? So I told her and she said, you know what? You're gonna be back. And a year later I was back um, working on a live action show um, uh, called Nickelodeon's Total Panic. It was three hours live to tape. Incredible. All the people that worked on that show wanted to do amazing things. But um, the point I want to say is that Jerry remembered me. And my first day back at Nickelodeon, she came and found me and said, I told you you'd be back. Um, and she, she and Nickelodeon have just been a constant in my life. I've gone on to do lots of other things, but really thrilled to be back there now. It's kind of in my blood. That's great. And Jen, how did it work out for you in film? What was your first job, your first experience in children's media? 
Um, well, as a kid, I was obsessed with the peanuts. Um, I used to read the comics and used to cut them out. I had this journal that I would take them up and glue them into, and I drew my own. Um, and then one one day, I, I saw the one of the specials, one of the, the Christmas I think it was the Christmas special, probably. And I had this aha moment, like, oh my goodness, I could take these little drawings that I've been doing, and I could make them. Move and tell stories with them. It just all clicked in my head. Of course I knew what animation was, but it didn't occur to me until that like moment when I was about six or seven, that it could be something that, that I could do. And so I ran and told my mother immediately, like I wanna be, I, I don't think I knew the word animator yet. I think I said I wanna be someone who makes my drawings move. And the most amazing part about that is that she listened to me and believed me and she found an animation class for me to join um, yeah, I was, I was like seven at the time and she convinced, um, I don't really know where it was, I should ask her, but she convinced them to allow me to attend. It was for teenagers. Um, and, uh, and so that's how I was able to uh, make my first film, it was this cut paper stop motion film. Um, and then I'm just going to fast forward all the way till now, which is, I have a company, Snowflake Films here in Brooklyn, uh, where we make animation, um, and we, I named the studio um, after uh, Susie Snowflake, which is the, <laughs> which is the first thing my mother ever saw on TV. Um, she remembers that moment when she first saw uh, TV. It was uh, this little animated character called Susie Snowflake. They're like, oh, Susie Snowflake, da, 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 da. and she used to sing that to us as a sort of bedtime lullaby and, and tell us about the first time she ever saw TV and how, how magical it was for her. So I, I just uh, connected that to sort of my first experience, my first sort of like aha moment. Um, so anyway, I, since this is about you know, women who inspire you and, and, and encourage you, I felt like that was a, a good story to tell because I feel like uh, my mom has been a, oh. huge, a huge inspiration to me. Yeah. Sarah, what inspired you to get into children's media? Um, it was a combination of a terribly boring job working um, in the claims department of an insurance company, really like watching the clock get to the time I got, got to leave um, and watching a reboot of The Muppet Show and watching a puppet fly across the, the TV screen. And it became really clear to me as I was approaching college that I wanted a career that would not end me up in a cubicle, but be on my feet surrounded by creative pe people that are throwing things, puppets, ideally. Um, and so I knew going into college that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, I was doing theater and high school and just like liking that creative energy. I think, Lynn, as you were talking about, like that bug, I just kind of knew that was, I wanted a creative field and I wanted a collaborative field. Um, and then when I got to, and also I had these, um, really like formative memories of watching Sesame Street and um, other children's shows with my parents and remembering the meaning that those all had um, still as I was you know, getting older, those memories and how much they stuck with me. And so it wasn't until college that I read The Tipping Point and learned that Sesame Street wasn't intended for me um, and learned <laughs> that these methods on Blue's Clues in that chapter, um, that book by Malcolm Gladwell, that television could be made so thoughtfully and could impact in such a massive way, I was hooked. Um, so I was lucky I had an internship at Henson um, for a summer. I, I interned at my local PBS station in, in Virginia and I graduated and there were no jobs um, in TV. I thought for sure I would get one. Um, and so I uh, kind of hold out at the International Spy Museum um, for two years uh, before I made the big leap to pack up everything and move to New York, where I found, um, I think on Synopsis or maybe Media Pros, an internship um, posting at Little Airplane Productions where they were working on the second season of Ubi, a bear hand puppetry show, and they were working on the pilot of what became the Wonder Pets. And I, just kind of like with white knuckles held on to that experience until it grew into a, a job offer as an office manager. And that was an incredible learning opportunity for me because the entire studio was in 
one building and every morning the entire team would sit around a table and talk about what they were doing that day. So I was so hungry for information and building this community and knowledge. And I got to watch the pipeline as each person sort of talked about what they were going to do that day. And I was such a sponge. And also at that time, Livia Beasley, the founder of, of Women and Children's Media, was starting to host programming. And so that's where I started going and attending events and building, you know, the, the beginning of, of my network um, through there. So I'm really fortunate that was that. And then every other position has been because of the network and word of mouth at the jobs that I've had. Um, and then, yeah, which landed me at Nine Story, where I've been for the past 16 years, working on various things. Yeah. Well, you know, I know that uh, Lynn has mentioned and Joey's mentioned some female leadership when they were coming up through the ranks. Um, Ellen, was there anybody who was like a, a role model for you when you were coming up in the media? Oh, yeah, many. Um, Reading Rainbow was really mostly women um, and some great women leaders there. Um, Cecily Truitt and Twyla Liggett, who were two of the P three people that I assisted. The other was Cecily's husband, Larry Lancet. Um, I learned a lot from watching Cecily and Twyla and to Sarah's point, being a sponge. Like, I think one of the great things about an assistant type job is that it gives you the opportunity to literally be in the room when things are happening and to be able to learn from watching people. So um, Cecily was really, um, it was fun. It, like she got so into it when she was having a creative idea and kind of figuring things out. Um, it was really fun to just be able to watch and observe that. Um, all of the producers on Reading Rainbow, um, in particular, Kathy Kinsner um, and Jill Gluckson uh, and Stacey Rader, I just learned a ton from being their associate producer um, and working closely with them and seeing how they worked and learning, taking what I, learning what I could take from their approach. Um, and one of the good things about Rainbow was that there were multiple production teams, like each episode, each half hour episode would have a producer, associate producer pair. So I got to watch lots of different people work and I got to work with different producers. So I learned a ton from that. Um, the other person that I just learned immensely from was Ronnie Krauss, who was a producer on Rainbow and also a writer. Um, she was also a writer on Cyber Chase. And um, she was like, she was the one that we all were like, what would Ronnie do? Um, she, she, uh, was uh, having her first child and and stopped traveling on the road for Rainbow. And that's how I got to move into production. A space opened. You know, Lynn talked about headcount and that's like such a real thing. Like there has to be space to move up at a small company. So it was Ronnie who indirectly, you know, gave me that opportunity. And then I got to work with her um, on Cyber Chase. And also at Rainbow, what was interesting is that I never worked directly with her because she had taken into, gone into a different job. So I got to kind of know her and observe her without directly working with her, which was really interesting. Like I just, um, you know, those, those uh, she's was very um, forthright and um, had lots of questions always and was unafraid to ask her questions and unafraid to disagree. And uh, I think that even when you're working with all women, it's important to be able to do those things um, and it's also important sometimes as a woman, if you're the lone woman or one of few women in a room full of men to be able to say what you think and to be able to have that discussion um, and feel like you got this because um, it's not always easy. Yeah. So Ronnie was amazing. Okay. Jen, how was it for you um, starting out in film? Who are your leadership? Like who who's providing leadership for you? Um, well, I went to NYU uh, Film School and Animation, and um, I, I got this internship really because um, Nickelodeon uh, called the animation floor. And I, I guess I was always there, so it, it, there was that too. And I said, we're looking for an intern who can join the team over at, at Nick Animation. And, uh, and so the, they put the, put the person on full hold and went out into the animation floor and said, who wants an internship? And I was like, oh, I'd like one. <laughs> and they just sort of put, put me on the phone with this person. And next thing I knew, 
I was interning for Linda Semensky and Mary Harrington oh, on Ren and Stimby, uh, Doug and, and Rugrats. And, um, you know, it, Linda and, and Mary, the, the two of them have been a huge inspiration for me. I and mean, they give just amazing advice and they're so supportive. And I feel like I, I really credit um, the, the both of them for um, a, a lot of my success in my career. I remember when I first walked into Linda's uh, office, it just had all this cool stuff, like just toys and and <laughs> wines and just things from her career. That and and it was just like I was like, wow, I, I want to do that. I want to have a cool office like that. And 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 she had this just way about her, you know. She just uh, the way way of talking to people and um, just teaching. Uh, you know, she she often would bring me into her office and say, hey, you know, I got these scripts in from Ren and Stimpy. Uh, why don't you read them and, and tell me what you think? And, you know, I was, I was just an intern and, and uh, she didn't have to do that. And, and Mary uh, did the same thing, you know, just over lunch. She would just come sit with, with, uh, with me and just, just chat. And um, I feel like that those moments are just so, uh, so special and so memorable. That's great. All right, so let's shift now to the fact that you guys are all leaders in your in your roles in children's media. Um, Joe, I want to talk to you about yours because yours is definitely a little different than you know animation and um, other things we're talking about here. Um, who, who are the leaders for you guys? What are you? How are you leading your 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 uh, your project, your your people in, in children's media? Um, you mean uh, so in terms of how we're leading in terms of digital media yeah, as I'm, women in the yeah, space? Yeah, in games it seems like it's a little it's different. I mean, if you look at the United yeah. States, it seems it's, to be way more heavily male, but it seems to be the opposite. Yeah. Of what you're saying. in Australia. So how how is how have we made that come about? Is it always been the case? Uh, it hasn't. It's it's really it's actually quite strange. So when I was living in America. Um, uh, it was much more female driven, um, the uh, tech and games industry with the people that I was working with. And a lot of the people that I was working with um, who were connected to television, such as um, all of your talented selves, um, was very female led. So there was a lot of inspiration there. I have actually found in the Australian um, industry, uh, the, the games industry itself and the interactive industry is actually much more um, male uh, heavy, but the um, I've got some really great mentors. Um, the head of the Interactive Games Association of Australia, which I'm a member of, which Tumus is a member of, is um, the CEO is a woman, Raylene Knowles, who's like super inspirational. Um, I actually go to her for advice and she's really um able to like break problems apart and really un help us understand like the problem spaces that we have when we're trying to move forward as women in this industry. Um, but overall um, in tech, uh, the, the, the women that have been inspiring me um, are women who have um, kind of made their own way up through the industry, starting as production assistants, getting their foot in the door, dealing with a lot of issues that they had in the you know 90s and 2000s with um, a lot of sexism um, and um, a, a really quite inspirational and, and strong women to work with. Um, so an, another one I should mention is actually a lady who works with me, um, Fleur, who's the head of finance for the Asia Pacific region. Um, and she's um, an absolute badass and she's like a technologist and um, a finance expert and a mentor and um, like even people just in your own office that you find as mentors are, are, are really helpful. So Sarah, have you faced any challenges like that in uh, coming through children's media? I have been incredibly fortunate that the majority of my uh, bosses and leaders and coworkers have been predominantly female. Um, I, at Out of the Blue, the company that um, Angela Santamero founded, co-founded um, for a long time, I think there was one male uh, colleague um, and it just was such an incredibly uh, welcoming and, and wonderful um, environment. Um, so I've been very lucky, but I certainly have had experiences that upon reflection of the Me Too movement, um, where I have thought to myself, why, why did, you know, these men have the kind of power over us? 
Um, and there's a book that I turned to um, by Reshma Sojani called Brave, Not Perfect, um, which I highly recommend um, about just, I think, as women, um, we are perfectionists and uh, we don't embrace failure. And I really liked her perspective on um, on some of those oh, those habits to, to become bigger risk takers um, and uh, embrace the imperfections that help us all grow. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's an interesting industry because most of the leadership and mentors and role models I've had the pleasure of working with have been female. Right. Lynn, how do you feel about that? Are there any challenges with that? I mean, I have to say I've been super lucky also. Um, I, you know, I started as a television producer and, um, you know, uh, Dina and Shelowitz at Noggin gave me the chance to switch actually from TV to digital. Um, she gave us the opportunity. She said, TV people, digital people switch jobs. And so that's how I learned to produce games and apps and websites and then the wonderful women at PBS Kids, everyone from Linda Szymanski, who I adore, to Sarah DeWitt and Abby Jenkins and Shannon Bishop, they gave me incredible opportunities on many different TV shows um, to be the games producer, to be the digital producer. Joey Edgar, sitting on this very panel, <laughs> hired me at Sesame Street to do a whole bunch of games and stuff. And we've taken turns actually hiring each other. Um, so, I mean, I've had, especially I find actually in the digital space and the game space for kids media, it's been run by a lot of women and super supportive of each other. Um, whenever I was at a transition, I would call Linda or I'd call Abby and they'd be like, oh, we got something for you, <laughs> you know, and they'd recommend and be incredibly supportive. So I feel That's awkward. Cool. All right. Well, you know, at CMA, we want to support and foster community within the industry as well. And I know Sarah, Lynn, and Joey, you've all held leadership roles within CMA. Um, in fact, you were here when it was originally women in children's media. But beyond CMA, what do you think is the best way to support other women in leadership positions? Uh, I, can yeah, I, Joey. Um, yes. just from a tech perspective, um, I think it's really um, important to be honest and open about um, any challenges or problems that you're having and speak to people about them. Um, I hear this a lot and this was my problem, my ongoing problem is um, uh, don't be afraid to ask for what you need. Um, a really simple thing is um, when you get a job offer, um, think about what your salary is, what, what salary you want and add like 50%. Um, don't don't be shy and don't um, just uh, take whatever is given to you. If you disagree with something, feel free to speak up. And it can be really hard at first, but you do get used to it. Um, but most of all, um, just be yourself and don't try and be anyone else. Anybody else want to answer that question? I have um, a new a new philosophy that if you want a seat at the table, you should host the party. Um, Ellen, I take this a little bit a page out of your book, but um, it is, and I think CMA is a beautiful example of, you know, you need to work at your network and there's nothing stopping us from bringing this community together. I think CMA is such a beautiful conduit to make those connections and allow for people to make those, those connections and, and bring people together. But if you're really interested in this niche thing that CMA is not offering, approach them and volunteer to host it, right? Like there are just these amazing ways that we all have the power to continue to give back um, and grow our networks. And it comes back in spades. Um, but I think we all have a responsibility, especially as we get farther along in our in our careers to, to hold space for people to come together and, you know, um, and, and have those those opportunities to be open and honest with each other. Um, it just is, I think, essential um, of, of how we foster and grow. I 100% agree with you, Sarah. And and once you get into a position where you know where you can bring on bring on um, folks to work with you, I mean, Nickelodeon podcasting is really full of incredible women. Um, the Nick Digital Studios team is run by 
some fabulous women, Ashley Kaplan um, and Kyle Cushman. Also a great guy, Alex Reeds. He, he kind of fits in with the rest of us. He lets us grow. But it's important, and they have let me grow my team with people who are amazing. And, um, you know, giving the opportunity to have other women come join the team, come join the party, as you put it, Sarah, is is an awesome, um, it's an awesome chance. And when you get in that position, I would say, try to take that opportunity to expand your guest list, expand your party and bring other folks in and mentor them, frankly. I think that's really important. Remember where you came from and all the folks that helped bring you along the way, so. Yeah, I think it's also important to question the processes, the processes that you yourself use, but also anything that you inherit, because there's a lot of, you know, talking about finding jobs and finding people, uh, like how do we help people find the jobs, you know? And CMA does have a great job board, um, but it's like there's so many ways that people need to be connected and that looking at multiple ways to connect with people. I think also on the, you know, when you're growing your career in particular, which honestly, I, I'm still growing my career, but like in the, when you're starting out and you're growing your career, also just understand that it is a long game, <laughs> that life is hopefully long and hopefully, you know, you, you find the industry that you want to be in and you're in it and you move around as you want to. But like there are people, um, like I ended up at Cyber Chase because of somebody that I met in my very first job and who I had then, I worked with like six years, seven years after I first met her. Then we worked together for not even a year. And then she called me three years later when there was a job at Cyber Chase. And, um, and I ended up at Fred Rogers Productions because Paul Siefkin and I, he was at PBS, I was at Cyber Chase, and we got to know each other through that and be friends and like kind of get to know each other's taste and outlook. And that took, I guess that was probably, what was that? It was like 10 years, you know, from the time when we first met and we we're working together that he got to FRP and then called me to be like, hey, come over. You know, so it's like you develop these relationships and you should be open and aware of all the people that you're meeting and um, and, you know, diversifying who, who you're meeting with and um, just always looking. I think of it as like gardening, you know, some things bloom more quickly than others, but you should always be planting seeds and always be like taking care and, and you know, growing and watering truly. Just, just to add to that, I would say it's sort of like passing it along, you know, because I, I have folks reach out to me all the time and I don't always have things at the company, you know, that I can offer. But I always think of, well, maybe Sarah would or maybe Ellen would be a good person to talk to or maybe Lynn or maybe Joey. I don't know you that well. <laughs> now I do. Uh, you know, it's like and I get calls like that, too. You know, oh, can you have an informational with so and so or oh, can you talk to them? about this and I, I always say yes. Um, and I think that um, it, it's it's never, you never not have time to have like, you know, a 15 minute, half an hour conversation to help someone move to the next stage. And there's always, something always comes of it too, you know, oh, you know what? I think, you know, I think you could actually contact this person and they might, they might have something for you. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that quickly as well, um, to what Ellen and Jennifer said, um, my twin sister taught me, um, when I was starting out, if there's something you're curious or interested in um, doing or learning, just sprinkle it in conversation. Like you don't go into it. It's just like, oh, by the way, I'm interested in like ABC Kids Digital. That's really cool. I'd love to work there. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that someday. Um, and that's it. And sometimes like that people remember that. And maybe two years later, someone will be like, oh, that person's interested in that. Let's connect them. Um, so just like sprinkling in what you're passionate about into conversation um, can sometimes be like a nice, easy type of networking. Great, that's great. So my next question is about you know diversity and inclusion. So I'm talking about it not just in terms of gender, which is really primarily what we're talking about tonight, but across other dimensions of identity as well. Um, I don't know if maybe Sarah, if you want to take that, maybe in relations to um, the kind of spark, which you know, Nine Story is releasing today. You said right. I believe so. I don't know if it's in the United States, but um, Nine Story, as so many companies in the 
industry have made a real commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we're all on a journey. Um, and I think at this stage, the biggest takeaway is that we need more representation behind the camera making big decisions um, if we want to have of representation on the camera on screen. Um, and so the project that Karen mentioned is called A Kind of Spark based on a book of the same name uh, written by a neurodivergent writer, Al McNichol, um, about a nine-year-old girl who um, learns about um, the witch trials that happened in her town in Ireland um, and identifies with uh, the stories that she's hearing about these women who are who are different um, and petitions to set a memorial forward. So it's a new series that's um, uh, premiering this week. We're all very excited about it. Um, and in addition to the story being really exciting for us to tell, there was um, uh, there was a lot of work to make sure that there was representation um, behind the screen to making sure Elle McNichol was involved heavily in the writing. A lot of our crew uh, were neurodivergent as well as the actors who played our characters. Um, and so I think we're, you know, we're, we're all adjusting and adapting to systemic, um, uh, you know, infrastructures and we all need to be making a commitment um, together to, to do better. Um, and so we're, we're all really proud uh, at this particular property and I hope you'll check it out. So, in regards to the new generation of upcoming generation of women wanting to work in children's media, do you have any advice for them? Well, I think, you know, a lot of what we've talked about tonight is following your, um, I would say follow your curiosity, follow that passion, be smart about it, like be focused and professional um, in um, thinking about how to, um, it's not just how to represent, how to be in a meeting, how to like understand the work part of it. I think that one of the things that can be that people get confused about in the early stages is wanting to be creative, which is like definitely what sparked for me in the beginning. And I think all of us talked about that, but it's like, it's a job and you get to be creative as part of the job, but it's still within the construct of like having, um, having budget, having schedule, having deliverables, having like real things that you are accountable, people that you are accountable to and for. And um, so I think that really kind of trying to learn the ecosystem of work wherever you end up in a job, like being aware, like watch how things are done and listen to how things are done. And, you know, try to find people who can act as mentors um, and, and, and whether or not they're aware of it too, you know, like if you're really watching someone and you're learning, you can learn a lot of good and bad stuff, honestly, by watching how people act and interact. And I think that, um, in that like early stages, it's like really important to kind of learn how to read a room, which is truly a thing. That's something that you need. Ultimately, if you're pitching, you have to know how to like understand how people are reacting to what you're saying, but also in a meeting, in a conversation, in a negotiation that is just among two people who work together every day, like paying attention to how things are done and how things get done, I think is, um, uh, I think that's something that I, I was able to do. And again, it had something to do with how Reading Rainbow was organized because that's where I spent my 20s basically. But like being able to watch how people collaborate, that it's not all easy and all happy. You know, it's like there are, it's hard sometimes, especially if you have an idea and your colleague has an idea and they are not the same idea. You know, you have to figure out how you get to a happy place and get to a place where is the, you know, the best for the show and the best for the audience and, you know, the most realistic for your budget and your deadlines. But like, I think um, um, really kind of taking a breath and being able to know that it's like everything doesn't have to happen in the first two years of your career go for it for sure. But like, also like, listen, watch, take things in, you know, it's sort of a research and development phase where you're just like, you're in it and um, uh, have the opportunity to really be watching and learning what's happening around you. Um, I think there's just, there's huge opportunity in that. And um, yeah, that's my, that's my advice. I mean, that's excellent advice. <laughs> um, I think that is, 
smart across the board. The only thing that I would add to that is take the time to meet the people around you. Um, when you first start in a place, try to get some informationals, go see if someone will have a cup of coffee with you so you can talk to them and just find out who they are, what inspires them, make those connections and keep those connections and those friends close. The ones that you make in your twenties are the ones that you have throughout your career. Karen and I started together. Um, Sarah and I've been to get friends for a really long time too. Like you start together and you all trade people, trade job, um, job leads, you trade um, good folks that you meet, recommendations of great animators or writers or directors or producers. And it starts with your first job on. Um, yeah, I'd also add, um, uh, don't be afraid of that um, foot in the door job. Don't be afraid of taking the job that you think might be a bit beneath your um, your degree or whatever, because sometimes those jobs can be really impactful and really, as uh, as other people are saying, like help you understand how the like work company works and understand how people really are. Um, and um, my first my first office job was actually like using an early version of Photoshop and my job was literally cleaning dirt off um, prints of car part diagrams. But that's what got me like really into like Photoshop and technology and stuff like that, as well as the game stuff. So like, even though that was a really menial job that actually really inspired me and had a huge impact in my career. I might just add that fostering your network is a really critical part of growth and it takes time and energy. Um, I think I was just this week, I called a fellow producer at another studio and I had a conundrum and we sat on the phone for 45 minutes and we talked about it. And I thought about how generous and kind this competitor, right? Somebody who's working at another studio it sat and we talked and we collaborated together. And that's because we've been fostering that friendship and that professional relationship for many years. Um, and it's it's very easy. I sort of make that, I share that anecdote just to talk about how generous and kind. Jen, I know how busy your schedule is and that you would say yes to in, you know informational interviews and you go out of your way. And I can imagine the rest of the people here make time. Um, it's not hard to do, but it is such a wasted resource if you can get time on Ellen's calendar for 30 minutes and you never follow up and you don't follow her advice and like it ends there. It's just such a waste of resource. Those LinkedIn, you know, connections, like write a note, let us know that you were here and keep that conversation going, right? It's where we all really are sitting in a place here because we want to help elevate the next generation of media makers and um and and there is a lot of kindness i think and intention in that um but it does take work it does i think it does really take effort and energy to maintain those and have that network work for you and if you can figure it out it really is a gift yeah and just to add to that to what sarah is saying it's like it is it is the perseverance and not to get knocked back if someone doesn't reply to your email right away or something, it's okay. Like everybody is busy and it's hard. Like email is a monster, you know, and, and Slack and Basecamp and whatever and texting, like <laughs> all of it, there's a lot of communication. So I think another thing is to not take it personally if you don't hear back from someone right away, it's okay. They're not, they're not, they're not mad. They're not like, oh God, why did she contact or why did he contact me? It's more of like, oh my gosh, I have seven sets of notes to write and I do want to sleep today. So how am I going to get this all done? And I didn't get through my email. You know, at least this is me. This is my story. <laughs> but like, it's really um, so important to kind of both sides, grow your career and look for new people. And it's on all of us who have been in the industry a while to always be looking for new people to meet and new people, new ways to open the doors and be transparent about how things are done and how somebody who doesn't know anybody can get to meet people, which is where LinkedIn and Sarah's comment about suggestion to, you know, make a connection and say, I saw the CMA event, I attended that and wanted to connect. Write that little note, 
you know, LinkedIn gives you that opportunity, say a little something personal. Um, those are all good things. And it just, it is, it just takes a lot over time, but a little over, a little over time adds up to a lot. Okay. I, don't yeah, have much, I don't have much to add, but cause you guys said it all so well, but um, I would just say be, um, don't be afraid to be vulnerable and let people know, you know, wh what you want to do and, and what skills you might have that they're unaware of because you might have been hired to do this one job, but you're actually an amazing illustrator and you actually have really great story ideas. And don't be afraid to just step out. Like I had an intern who um, drew caricatures of the entire staff and just presented it to, to me. And it was just such a lovely, lovely gesture. And it let me know, wow, she's really she can draw. She's a really great illustrator. So it's like, but anyway, it's like it's like stepping out of that of that comfort zone and just um, showing people who you are. Well, thanks for all those answers and replies for uh, and giving advice to our members. Um, I think we have some questions here too. So Carolyn and Yona will be fielding some of those questions. Hello to everyone, and first and foremost, thank you to our panelists for this lovely discussion. So the first question is from the lovely Melissa Victor. So she wants to know, can anyone talk about what the numbers look like for women of color in the children's media space? And the floor is open to all panelists. I'm guessing that none of us have actual statistics to reference. Um, I think that would be actually a really interesting thing for CMA to look for a partnership on to do a real survey of. Um, but I can say that the, the anecdotal answer is underrepresented. Yeah. And we're working on it, but underrepresented. And we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would say in the digital industry, that's um, even more underrepresented and people are trying to work on it. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is... Um, uh, in Australia anyway, um, start, start at schools and find ways to um, ensure that there's better representation um, from the get-go, from, from kindergarten even. Um, this next one is from Karen Weinstein, and she says, Hi, panelists. As soon to be retired but not retiring, arts educator and all-around creative, in your experience, are children's media companies interested in hiring former teachers? Do you have any tips on how best to transition into your world of kids' media? Uh, from a digital perspective, um, in terms of kids' media, I, I know some people who have been educators who have transitioned um, as a first step as educational advisors. So um, uh, finding um, partnerships with um, digital specialists who, for example, we've worked um, uh, on media literacy, for example, and, and have contracted educators to start with helping for advisement there. And then, um, then these people have grown their um, digital knowledge and digital capabilities and have made that into their own career there's a there's a guy in um australia called dan donahue who's really great and um that's that's his career now as a as a as an advisor to um media in, and innovation companies i think there's a lot of people with educator backgrounds um in kids media i will say paul siefkin who's the ceo of fred rogers productions started as a high school english teacher um and uh a lot of people at PBS Kids on the digital team in particular, I think have some um, either like uh, education, like education background and some teacher experience as well there. I think, you know, yes, definitely to, you know, coming in as an advisor is a great way to look at it. I would also say like, you know, look at where you really want to work and then kind of check out who people in and look for those kinds of connections because if you find someone who's had a path that's similar to yours you might be able to connect with them because they'll be like oh yeah I know you could make this transition probably like let's talk about what the skills you know what what skills are in common between you know what you've been doing as an arts educator and what you might do on different kinds of um, jobs and different kinds of projects um, so uh, I think that's like really look at where you want to work and yes, do like a broader thing, but look at some targeted things and see if you can find people that you have things in common with and reach out to them. Do any other questions? 
Yes, thank you, Ellen, for that. Um, our next question is from Deborah, who's wondering if there are any senior intern opportunities in the industry. I mean, there's definitely internships. I'm not sure about senior. I mean, at my company, we, we do paid internships, but it's usually, you know, just whoever is interested, you know, so if someone's senior, um, we would definitely consider them. Um, we had another question, and it was for Joey. Can you talk a little bit about AI and how that's sort of influencing the gaming space? Uh, yeah, the um, AI stuff in terms of um, like ChatGPT and the art stuff like Midjourney and Dali has been um, super impactful already in terms of the stuff that we've been prototyping. Um, it's just moving so fast and it's already so easy to implement. It's, um, it's, it we were able to build a prototype of a magic, we call it the magic storybook. It, it, it's a storybook that allows kids to write a prompt, um, we call it prompteneering, um, and then choose images and create their own storybook that has kind of been generated by both them and the AI. And it's really easy to implement, but there's no, like there's, we, we, we don't want to publish anything um, as a product because we need to really learn about um, childhood, um, ch child safety and privacy. And um, there's so, it's moving so fast that we need to be really careful around it. But what we want to do right now is do a lot of prototyping and really learn to understand how um, beneficial it's going to be in terms of entertainment and education and how it can impact linear and interactive there's just so many things you can do with it um but you need we need to be really careful and um uh consider everything ethically and um in terms of um safety and privacy awesome so our next question again i'll field it to everyone um is there any advice or input you may have about rejoining the workforce full-time after taking a break in your career I mean, I would say try to get yourself um, to come to places like the Children's Media Association and Women in Communications and some of these other organizations. Try to get involved um, in those areas. Try to do stuff. A lot of people, you know, it's not just they took a break. They were raising their kids or maybe they were involved in um, the Parents Association or whatnot. I mean, you know, they've done volunteer work. So that's actually work. So you should try to network and build on those kind of opportunities, I would say. Um, but come and join these kind of things. Try to come to meetups and places like that so you can get to know folks. We have one last question, then we can kind of wrap. Yeah, our last question is, what are your favorite, what was your favorite childhood show that you grew up on? I mean, Sesame, Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> Don music. Mr. I, Mr. Mr. Rogers. You know, I was living in Europe and um, they didn't have much kids TV, but um, we watched Felix the Cat. Um, which, uh, oh, really? Which had like definitely a, a big impact. I do want to call out Ren and Stimpy. I'm, I'm a fangirl. I'm a ma massive oh, fangirl. Okay. Me you. too. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank Sarah, Ellen, Joey, Jennifer, and Lynn for sharing their journeys and giving advice to our membership. And I also want to thank all of our audience for being here tonight and uh, have a good night. Mm -hmm.